run away. <laughs> oh, yeah, done. No, we're not going to just leave the problem. We can't plug in zero. The only thing you can do do here is what do you think? Can we use that same idea but only in reverse? Yeah. Let's try it. Go ahead and do that. Multiply by the conjugate. Conjugates have to have different signs. They have to. It's got to be the same thing on the numerator denominator. It has to, otherwise you're not multiplying by one, and if you're not multiplying by one, you're changing the problem. You can't change the problem. Also, one more thing I need you to look up here at the board. When you do this, that sign doesn't change. It's only the thing after the square root. So this stays the same. Did you all multiply by exactly that? Do you see how that is the conjugate? We have the square root, whatever that sign is, and that whatever that constant is. And that's what we have here, the square root, the different sign, same constant. Same exact thing. Why you, why you need the same exact thing, in case you're wondering, well, Mr. Leonard, why don't you change that sign as well? What you're <coughs> trying to do is multiply this in such a way that you actually eliminate the root. So when you multiply this one times this one, the whole entire root goes away, right? The only time you can do that is if the roots are identical. So you can't have different signs, otherwise they're not identical. Hey, which one aren't we going to distribute here, the numerator or the denominator? denominator. Don't distribute the denominator. By the way, I'm saving your lives here. If you distribute the denominator, you're going to have to factor it again. That wastes time. So literally, I'm saving your time, ergo your life. <laughs> nice, right? I know I'm such a nice guy today. So on the denominator, I know I'm going to have x and then the square root of 1 plus x plus 1. I'm not going to distribute that. The numerator, yes, you're going to distribute the thing you're trying to rationalize. So if you were to distribute this, why don't you all help me along here. When I distribute this, what's the first expression I'm going to get? <coughs> 1 plus x. Very good. Okay, and then what? So I'm going to get square root of x, uh, square root of 1 plus x, positive. Square root of 1 plus x, negative. That's going to be gone. That's what the conjugate does for you. And lastly, I'm going to get negative 1. So this is 1 plus x minus 1. Anything else we can do with that? Anything else? Yeah, combine like terms. What do you get if you combine like terms on the numerator? That's kind of nice because 1 and negative 1. And this is why we didn't distribute the denominator. Because if you look at that, that's what we're trying to simplify out, right? We're trying to get rid of that. 99% of the time, this works out for you. <coughs> I wrote it back because it doesn't matter. Now that you see the x and x as a factor on the denominator, those things are gone. What's on your numerator, please? Oh, zero is not on your numerator. What's on your numerator? Come on now, people. One, yeah. When you cross something out, you don't get a zero. You're actually factoring that out, saying x over x is one, so you have a one up there. Uh, by the way, please don't make the, the intermediate algebra mistake of doing this. A lot of people do this when they're just beginning. They go, oh, yeah, I crossed everything out, therefore I have that. Is that true? No. no, no, you don't have that. You actually have this. If you forget that, what you're going to end up, with, end up with is the reciprocal of the answer that you actually want. That's not good. Hey, now can you plug in zero and be okay? Yeah, even though you still have x on the denominator, look what happens. What's one plus zero? One. one. Square root of one? one. Plus two? One. Plus one. Plus one. Two. Said two. <laughs> I was one step ahead of myself. I'll just write on the board. There you go. One half. Would your raise your hand feel okay with our, our limits? Good deal. Now you know. We went a long way today. We now know how to evaluate and compute these limits. Uh, next time I'll show you how to do some piecewise limits, I'll show you some trigonometric limits, and then we're off to a fun start. Did you have fun today? Did you have fun today? 
All right, so welcome back. We're talking about limits. Uh, we're going to start talking about piecewise limits. Now, now, for us, we found out that when we're taking a limit, usually we can cancel out a problem, or if we can't, we'll use a sign analysis test because we have an asymptote. Hopefully you practice that in your homework. Were you okay with that idea? So generally what we're trying to do is plug in the number, plug in the where x is approaching. If it works, great, that's your limit. If it doesn't work, well then you have to factor, do something to find that limit. Typically factoring will we'll be able to simplify that a little bit, or we found out we can rationalize denominators and numerators if we have square roots. We can do things like that to work around that limit. Now what we're going to talk about today is some, some different aspects to that. We're going to talk about piecewise limits. I'll show you what you can do with those things. It's going to be kind of nice. You're just going to follow me on this. Then we'll talk about trigonometric limits and that'll, that'll end our day. We have a lot to talk about on trigonometric limits. So, piecewise limits. Here's basically the idea when you're talking about piecewise limits. And piecewise, of course, means different functions all matched together that have different directions for each part of it. You all have seen piecewise functions before. Piecewise limit says, what's the limit as we're approaching that interchange, basically, does it exist, does it not exist, what, what, what does it happen to be? So our idea is, we're going to have to take some one-sided limits, because each piece is different, right? We're going to take one-sided limits and see if they match up. If they match up, great, limit exists. If they don't match up, then no, the limit doesn't exist. Are you with me on this? I'll give you a real nice way to do this, a graphic organizer, hopefully this will help you out. And then, of course, if there's questions, man, ask. So let's, let's talk about this. Our idea is we're going to find some one-sided limits and we're going to see if they're equal. Let's start with an example. Let's say that I give you this. I say that your function is actually made up of three parts. The first part says you're going to do 1 over x plus 2 if x is less than negative 2. I say you have a different range. You have x squared minus 5. if we're between negative 2 and positive 3. And lastly, our last little step, we're going to be the square root of x plus 13 if x is greater than 3. Now, because we have a piecewise limit, we basically have, in this case, three different functions. That means we can't just look at this thing, hammer at it one function, and find out what is the limit uh, of, of any particular place. What I'm going to ask you for is can we find the limit at 2 and 3, as x approaches 2 and 3. Why 2 and 3? Well, if you look up here, that's the only place this could pop possibly have an issue, right, is negative 2, that would have an issue. Everywhere else it's continuous, the limit's going to exist, no problem. Same thing here, that's continuous everywhere. The only problem would be maybe at the end points of negative <coughs> 2 and 3. Here the only problem could be at 3 with that function. So we're going to talk about the limits as x approaches negative 2 and x approaches positive 3. Are you with me on that? So that, that's our idea here. What we're going to have to do is find our left side limit for each function and our right side limit and see if they meet up somewhere, if they meet up at those points. Now here's the way that I like to do this. First thing I like to do is draw a representation of your, uh, of your graph, of your number line, basically. Just like that. Break it up into the places where your piecewise function is broken up. What are those key points? What numbers uh, delineates our function from the next piece of the function? Where does one function start and one function stop, basically? Negative two. negative 2. That's a key point, right? So we're going to have to have negative 2 on here somewhere. What's another key point for us? Let's call this one function 1 and function 2 and function 3. Can you tell me what function is in this range over here, what, what function takes over for this interval? Function 3. Function 3, because it says for any x is bigger than 3, 
I'm now function three. Does that make sense to you? So I know that I'm looking at function three here. What interval, uh, sorry, which function takes over in this interval? Function two, for sure. And that leaves this one with f1. Let's make sure. x is less than negative two, function one takes over. Do you, do you understand that this is how actually our graph should look? It should be function one, then function two, then function three. And I'll, I'll draw this graph for you at the end, uh, just so you see what this really does look like. You with me still so far, though? So here's the idea. If we want to find the limit as x approaches negative 2 and the limit as x approaches negative 3, we don't have to find one side limits for all three functions, just the two functions that are approaching that number. So for instance, if I want to find the limit as x approaches negative 2, if I'm going from the left, if I'm going from the left, which function am I going to use? One. Function what? One. From the left, I'd be using function one. Does that make sense to you? Now, from the right, as we're approaching negative two, which function am I using from the right? Two. Function two. Yeah, that's right. So, so around this function, I'm going to have a one-sided limit from the left using f of one. Uh, sorry, the first function. Then I'm going to have a one-sided limit from the right using the second function. Does that make sense to you? It's a way to picture this. How about around three? We want x to approach three. But you guys over here, what function are we going to use as we approach 3 from the left? Function 2. Function 2, that's right, that's in this interval. How about from the right? Function 3. Function 3. We're not using function 1 over here, are we? We're not using function 3 over here. We're just looking around that, that number, what functions we have. So now, because we have this, this gives you a pretty good idea of what your graph looks like, right? This is how you make up your one side limits now. Okay, so I'm going to take a limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left, a limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right, and I'm going to see if those two things are equal, if those are equal, then we'll have a limit as x approaches negative 2. In <coughs> if not, well, then we won't. Do you all understand the idea so far? Are there any questions so far on the idea? Okay. So let's go ahead and let's try this. Um, what's the specific function I'm going to use for this one? This is negative 2 from the left-hand side. You all said that was function, which one? one. Which one? Well, what's function 1? One? 1 over x. Now write that. This one, by the way, is going to be the hardest. The rest of them are easy. How about going from negative 2 from the right-hand side? What function would we be using? <laughs> Isn't this kind of nice? You can just look at that, can't you? Kind of cool. Look at that one. Uh, now, function 2, what's the actual function 2? So write that. So we said for this range from the left, function 1. This range from the right, Function 2, we're going to see what these are. If they're the same thing, then our limit will exist. If they're not the same thing, will our limit exist? Okay, so we have that idea down. Now, how about we set the other ones as well? Let's start talking about the as we approach 3. So we're going to need, again, a limit as x approaches 3 from the left, 3 from the right. If they are the same,